To ask and answer the question of what is a man and the adjacent what is a woman, we must be clear about the various dimensions in which we can have this conversation. We can discuss it in the realm of physical biology of the sexes and the transformation from youth and maturity in the male sex, but we can also discuss it in the realm of energy, in the realm of personality, wherein we find that masculine energy is embodied by all. We'll be primarily focused on the nature of manhood and masculinity and the various archetypes of the male psyche. This is a very important conversation to be had the world over because of an underlying problem that exists in the relationship dynamic between men and women. It's a problem that many have described to be a lack of proper initiation for boys into manhood. We're probably all familiar with the following kinds of people. The company yes man, the gang member, the father who never has time to attend his daughter's school programs, the coach who ridicules his star athletes, the therapist who unconsciously attacks his clients shining and seeks a gray normalcy for them, the drug dealer, the ducking and diving political leader, the wife beater, the chronically crabby boss. All of these men have something in common. They're boys pretending to be men. And such men have arisen from undercurrent ways of thinking and being that believes that a man needs to be controlling, threatening, or even hostile in order to be strong. These traits are often encoded within us from a very young age, and many of us allow such thinking to prevail all the way to adulthood. But what is a man really? In order to answer this question, we must descend into the depths of archetypal analysis, as well as look at the transformation of men in the modern world over the past 70 years. I'd like to thank Robert Bly for his wisdom and words here, without which this commentary would not be so refined. Now in the West, there has been a pervasive idea of the American man, which makes it seem like there is a consistent quality of the image of a man that has remained stable over decades, or even within a single decade. But the men of today have moved far from the generations of men who have come before. We might imagine the old Saturnian farmer, proud of his introversion, who arrived from New England in the 1600s, willing to sit through three services in an unheated church. There was the greedy railroad entrepreneur that later developed in the Northeast, or whatever the hell kind of man DiCaprio played in Django Unchained. During the 1950s, an American character appeared with some consistency that became a model of manhood for many men. Let's call him the 50s male. He got to work early, labored responsibly, supported his wife and children, and admired discipline. This sort of man didn't see women's souls well, but he appreciated their bodies, and his view of world culture and America's part in it was boyish and optimistic. Many of his qualities were strong and positive, but underneath the charm and bluff there was, and there remains, much isolation, deprivation, and passivity. The greatest challenge with this man is that, unless he has an enemy, he isn't sure that he's alive. The 50s man was supposed to like football, be aggressive, stick up for his nation, never cry, and always provide. But receptive space or intimate space was missing in this image of a man. The personality lacked some sense of flow. The psyche lacked compassion in a way that encouraged the unbalanced pursuit of rivalries and war, and often brought with it a sense of coldness and even brutality towards the powerless, including the elderly, the unemployed, school children, and the impoverished. The 50s male had a clear vision of what a man was and what male responsibilities were, but the isolation and one-sidedness of his vision were dangerous. Now during the 60s, another sort of man appeared. The waste and violence of the Vietnam War made men question whether they knew what an adult male really was. If manhood meant Vietnam, did they want any part of it? The rise of the feminist movement encouraged men to actually look at women, forcing them to become conscious of concerns and sufferings that the 50s male labored to avoid. As men began to examine women's history and women's sensibility, some men began to notice what was called their feminine side and pay attention to it. This process continues to this day, and most contemporary men are involved in it in some way. There's something wonderful about this development, the practice of men welcoming their own feminine consciousness and nurturing it. This is important. Men have learned to become more thoughtful, more gentle. 
But society often likes to swing the pendulum too far whenever it makes a breakthrough, which often perverts the progress. As men embraced their feminine side, they did not become more free. Many men became instead nice boys who pleased their mother and the young women they lived with. It was in the 70s we began to see what we might call the soft male. These are lovely, valuable people. They're not interested in harming the earth or starting wars. There's a gentle attitude towards life in their whole being and style of living. But many of these men are not happy. They lack energy and vitality in them. They are life-preserving, but not exactly life-giving. Ironically, you often see these men with strong women who positively radiate energy. So here we have a finely tuned young man, ecologically superior to his father, sympathetic to the whole harmony of the universe, yet he himself has little vitality to offer. Of course, the dynamic of men and women cannot be avoided. The women of the 50s and 60s helped produce this soft male by saying that they preferred the softer, more receptive male. Understandably so, considering how hard and crude the 50s man was. Unreceptive maleness was equated with violence, and receptive maleness was rewarded. And as men started exploring this soft nature, women also started exploring their more masculine side. Though women generally tend to have a bit more inner balance within their yin and yang polarities, though that's a conversation we'll save for later in another video. Nevertheless, as you might imagine, men, for various reasons, wanted their women harder as women began desiring softer men. It seemed like a nice arrangement for a while, but it's clear that something still wasn't right. We've lived with it long enough now to see that it isn't working out. The amount of grief and anguish felt by so many men today, especially arising out of the hardness and remoteness of their fathers, has flowed into further trouble in their marriages or relationships. Do you ever wonder why divorce rates have never been at such an all-time high? Men have learned to be receptive, but receptivity alone isn't enough to carry their marriages through troubled times. In every relationship, something fierce is needed once in a while. Both partners need to have it. But at the point when it was needed, often the young man comes up short. They're nurturing, but something else is required to truly make their relationships and lives fulfilling. The soft male is able to say, I can feel your pain, and I consider your life as important as mine, and I will take care of you and comfort you. But he cannot say what he wants, nor stick by it. Resolve of that kind is a different matter. In the Odyssey, Hermes instructs Odysseus that when he approached Circe, who represents a certain kind of matriarchal energy, he is to lift or show his sword. Today, men do not even know or understand the difference between showing the sword and hurting someone. But showing a sword doesn't necessarily mean fighting. It is a concept that symbolizes a joyful decisiveness. A soft heart is balanced and protected by a sharp mind. The journey that many men today have taken into softness, or receptivity, or development of their feminine side, has been an immensely valuable journey. But more travel lies ahead. No stage is the final stop. What we need now is the wild man. To understand the wild man, first we have to gain some clarity on the archetype which is thoroughly explored in Robert Bly's book, Iron John. The wild man might be understood in opposing contrast to the savage, one who is wounded and in turn continues to wound themselves, the earth, and others. The wild man, on the other hand, examines his wound deeply. Such a one who undergoes this self-examination ends up resembling something like a Zen priest, a shaman, or a woodsman. In Iron John, we see a mythological tale emerge that can teach us a lot about this deep masculine self. Now for this video, here's a brief synopsis of the Iron John story, but please subscribe to this channel if you're interested in seeing a longer production in a future video. Iron John, the wild man, is discovered at the bottom of a deep well and put in a cage at the center of the king's court. The king's son, a young boy, is playing with his golden ball one day symbolic of his soul's light, and it bounces into Iron John's cage, who will not give it back unless the boy releases him. 
but truly wanting the ball back. Eventually, he agrees to release the wild man, needing to steal the key from under his mother's pillow, which is symbolic of her protection for him, but which ultimately will inhibit his growth from boyhood into manhood. Afraid of getting in trouble from his parents, the boy goes with the wild man into the forest. Iron John takes them to a secret magical spring and asks the boy to watch over it while he is away three days in a row, but not to touch the water. Yet, each day by accident, he does. First, it colors his finger and then his whole head of hair entirely gold. Being that he disobeyed the wild man, Iron John then sends the boy off on his own journey, where the boy finds another kingdom to live in and goes through several stages of initiation. He first becomes a cook, learning the path of ashes or descent into his own shadow self. Then he becomes a gardener, learning the lessons and path of the sensitive and gentle lover archetype. Then he becomes a knight, mastering the way of the warrior, until finally he wins the heart of the princess and becomes a true king, embodying the spirit of the divine masculine in its highest aspects and reuniting with his parents too. We also hear and see the transformation of the wild man, who, upon the boy's triumph of his soul, is also transformed into a king. The story is filled with symbolism, but here are some core ideas for you to consider about the boy's journey and the wild man. Iron John is not the sort of man you see in your day-to-day -day life. He is hairy, wet, living among the animals, uncivilized. The wild man is an enigma to the modern mind, especially because the corporations and governments of the day work so hard to establish the sanitized, hairless, and shallow man. The unfortunate result from this, quote, civilized world is that most men rarely take the time to explore all of the dimensions of their masculinity and therefore lack a certain vitality. The wild man is instinctive, sexual, and primitive. And there's a suggestion here that all men have, somewhere deep within the bottom of their psyche, a wild man, just as every woman has a wild woman. Getting in touch with the wild man, however, it should be known, is not about living in the wilderness, eating a certain way, or growing out one's hair. There is something much deeper than that, and living in harmony with the inner wild man does not mean that we don't wear a suit to work or live and function within the modern civilized world anymore. But it does hold within it a freedom to break the boundaries that are necessary to break in order to truly know oneself. It may mean embracing the intensity of a cold plunge with courage and faith, or spending hours writing poetry by the ocean, embracing the sense of freedom that comes from knowing oneself. There is an idea that supposes that at some young age, usually between seven or eight, we lose a sense of inner purity and wholeness as we move from the innocence of youth into teenagehood and adulthood, we become separated within ourselves and in the world, conditioned by culture and habits and driven into particular ways of thinking and being, removed from the innocent purity and lightness of spirit that we had as children. Growing up, most men want some nice person to help them return their ball back, meaning to return to their inner wholeness. But understanding the psychology of manhood deeper, we discover the need for the wild man, which comes from embracing that part of ourselves that is wet, dark, and low, what some might call soul. To be clear, the wild man is not the same as macho energy, which men already know enough about. Wild man energy leads to a dynamic action undertaken not with cruelty, but with resolve. The wild man is not opposed to civilization, but is not contained by it either. Curiously, the ethical superstructure of mainstream Christianity does not support the wild man, but there is some suggestion that Christ himself did. I mean, a big hairy John did baptize him, after all. Some people think that they can get in touch with the wild man through a fast track, like drinking ayahuasca or taking LSD. And while certainly these are methods for touching a deep part of the psyche, to truly get in touch with the wild man takes discipline and courage to go within and bucket out everything that's in the way of the true self. This resembles the art of slow discipline, more discipline than most are used to. 
There are many stages of meeting the inner wild man and the process of moving from boyhood to manhood. Ancient stories and cultures believed that a boy became a man only through ritual and effort, through the active intervention of other, older men. But these rites of initiation have become sanitized from mainstream culture today. And this is one of the primary reasons why we have the masculinity crisis that we have today. With initiation rituals lost, boys have no clear means of transitioning into manhood. In some generations of our ancient past, the men of tribes would take the young boys off into the wilderness for special rituals. Other processes for initiation often involved the relationship between father and son, where the son would go with the father to learn skills such as blacksmithing or wood carving. The idea in each of these examples provide a notion that the boy at some point must move out of the mother's world to the father's world, or out of the safe container that they grew up in to explore that which is beyond. Yet today, in a world where children often never even get to see what their parents do for a living, and schools are a cookie cutter system designed to orient children towards an industrialized mentality, it's no wonder that so many graduates don't really know what next to do to nourish their souls or truly be in service in the world in the highest way. Another core thing about the wild man that we must understand is that it's not about accessing higher consciousness, but in fact, going down instead. As they say, a tall tree can only grow as high as its roots are deep, and the depth of rooting is the first step. The seed starts in the dark of the earth after all. It is when one goes down, deep into their sadness and pain, and bring it to the surface, that the wild man truly becomes known. Passing through this stage properly, whether the long and slow journey, or the sudden fast route, known as catabasis, usually leads to profound liberation on the other side. If we were to ask and answer the question, what is a man? While on the surface, some might say that it is an adult male human, we might also see a man to be much more than that. A true man being the integrated being who has developed all of these archetypes within themselves and become whole. Because as we discussed in the beginning, this is not just a conversation about human males, but our inner masculine energy, as all of us have some component of these various archetypes and energies circling within, for better or for worse. The raising of our inner divine masculine energy involves going within, going down, and realizing the part of ourselves that so many of us avoid. The process is truly a beautiful one when it is embraced, even if it's hard at first, inviting us to look at our wounds. Sometimes, the best way to start is simply by finding someone to talk to. Even for myself, for most of my life, I thought the idea of having a counselor was foolish. But I was wrong. One of the greatest decisions I ever made for myself, I now realize, is embracing with humility the fact that I needed someone to talk to to help me process everything that was going on within me. And I'm so grateful that I did. So if any of this resonated with you, I encourage you to seek and explore this material or set up support for yourself. Of course, today we've spent a lot of time exploring the book Iron John, and I'd also like to recommend King Warrior Magician Lover by Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. When we stand in service to one another and seek wisdom from those who have walked similar paths, we find the strength to navigate life's ups and downs while staying grounded in our own center. As we wrap up today's episode, let's refocus on the concept of initiation, the crucial journey from boyhood into manhood that is rarely addressed in today's mainstream world. Similarly, the transition from girlhood to womanhood often lacks the guidance it deserves. But it doesn't have to be this way. By embracing an initiatory journey, we can unlock the deeper aspects of ourselves. While the modern world may overlook these rites of passage, they still exist for those who seek them. One such process is the seven day transformation, a week long guided experience designed to support seekers of higher wisdom in finding themselves and moving into a higher consciousness by exploring the depths within. Originally intended to be called the seven day initiation, this course offers a gentle yet profound path of inner work, allowing you to progress at your own pace in a world that often moves too quickly. Alongside the course, you are welcomed into the Spiritverse Academy community, where you can engage in weekly challenges and events 
fostering deeper unity both within and with others. If you're intrigued and want to learn more, click the link at the top of the description to discover how thousands have transformed their lives in just seven days using this powerful method. On the other side of the experience, you'll be amazed at how profoundly your life can change. And as always, thank you so much for watching.